thank you very much for that warm introduction. Um, I first want to start off by positioning myself for the reason why I'm here. As Gender Dynamics is not so much a refugee organization or institute or law clinic, but actually a transgender or transsexual and also gender non-conforming organization. The reason why I'm here then also is because Gender Dynamics in the past few years did help uh, trans refugees from different countries. And um, I think it will maybe happen more and more regarding the type of laws that happens across this continent. So the paper I want to deliver about um, when a progressive constitution is not enough and other challenges is much more out of the viewpoint of LGBT organizations in South Africa who is many times by refugees and also um, researchers and people from the north being considered as a liberal country with a constitution that backs us up and things like that. So I'm really just going to actually give you a background on the situation in South Africa, how we came to have the constitution that we have and how that intersects with our challenges as organizations um, assisting refugees who are LGBTI. And then I really hope we actually will rather have an open floor discussion and talk more about that than just me standing and speaking here about things that we can Google. So, um, <laughs> Shaking off the shackles of apartheid, South Africa gained its democratic freedom in 1994. Compared to other countries on the continent and globally, the democratization process went fairly smoothly. There was no civil war, no coup or genocide. Many anti-apartheid activists worked endlessly, publicly and behind the scenes, conducting meetings to ensure inclusiveness when drafting the new South Africa's constitution. Intersections of anti-oppression, anti-apartheid struggles and that of inclusion of homosexual rights into the new constitution ensure the constitution we have today. Much appreciation has to go to Simon Tegon Pauli, who was not only an anti-apartheid and queer activist, but also the founder of the gay and lesbian organization of Pitvater's Fund, we known as GLOW. GLOW had many black members and was the first gay and lesbian organization based in black townships. Simon's mobilization of gay and lesbian organizations um, paved the way for inclusion in the anti-discrimination bill of South Africa. <coughs> With these battles in the background, during negotiations of the constitution drafting process, LGBT, and I put I, oh, I the T actually, and I in, in brackets, issues were taken into the ANC and drafting platforms. The Constitution of South Africa was adopted in 1996 and is seen as one of the most progressive in the world. It recognizes a sexual orientation and because it has gender written in following sexual orientation, it has been said that it can be interpreted as gender identity as well. South African legal systems actually acknowledge many other rights to LGBTI persons <coughs> including the fact that same-sex couples and LGBTI individuals can adopt children, be on each other's medical insurance, legally inherit from a partner when there is not a written law or a state. In 2003, South Africa once again became one of the few trendsetters. Only a handful of governments in the world acknowledge the right of transgender people to challenge their legal sex status without having to undergo genital surgery. This progressive law was officially signed by the then President Tabu Mbeki and printed in the Government Gazette for public announcement. Since 2005, the inception of Gender Dynamics as an NGO focused on transgender, transsexual and gender non-conforming individuals and here onwards I will only speak of trans in compassing the whole Arranged words. The organization is and on various levels with different strategies engaged in challenging the Department of Home Affairs to actually inter implement Act 49 of 2003. And that is still the case today. We are in 2011 and it is not fully implemented yet. <laughs> Against the backdrop of a country where domestic violence rate and organized crime, including gangsterism, increases at an alarming rate. 
In December 2006, South Africa became the fifth country in the world where same-sex couples can be legally marry. It cannot be ignored any longer. South Africans need to realize that what happens in South Africa is not in isolation what happens on the rest of the continent. As a direct result of the passing of the Civil Union Bill in South Africa, Nigeria opted as a response to the disgrace which South Africa has brought to the continent that it will step up its laws against sodomites and homosexuals, making the lives of LGBTI people in Nigeria unbearable. Over the next few years, we witnessed how other African leaders mentioned the so-called atrocities of how South African leaders, um, under the name of human rights, um, just keep on going to be more un-African. Over the, um, due to many influences and political undercurrents, more African countries introduced stringent anti-homosexual laws. The most recent and most notorious being in Uganda, but Rwanda and Kenya also toyed with the idea. After Tewongi and Stephen were pardoned in Malawi, Malawi stepped up its laws by explicitly including lesbians in these sodomy laws. All these escalating severe living conditions contribute to a real threat of safety for LGBTI, same sex loving, and trans and gender non conforming people. In some instances, one might reason that LGBT activists, human rights defenders, and prominent individuals might have possible access to destination countries abroad when the need arises to flee. Canada and Sweden, followed by the USA, proved to be popular choices. There are regular calls for conferences, fellowships, and invites on listservs, organizational websites, and within the human rights, LGBT, and activism circles, including travel, fair, scholarships, and accommodation. But where does the LGBTI person who is, many, in many instances, does not even necessarily claim the acronym LGBTI? Where are they, the people that are just living their life, expressing themselves, where do they speak? The country that is promising the most equitable life, the best environment and freedom of expression seems to naturally be South Africa. It is also the country most likely to be accessible in the case of a person who does not have conference invites, access to support organizations and other informal networks. A person who has made their own way to South Africa most likely without any prior knowledge to the international LGBTI or human rights sector and with no contacts or networks, will also possibly have no visible support. They merely managed to arrive in the country with their last resources, collected from various creative ways, or family members in the case of being fortunate enough that your family was not actually the people kicking you out. By the time they are able to access any system, be it a refugee organization, LGBTI organization, churches, shelters, or any other, they are really left with no resources. Their health is possibly in jeopardy, having experienced a huge amount of trauma, and they might be with minimal clothing. South African winters are cold. I'm sure you all will know in this room the type of situations how refugees arrive in the country. For the sake of this presentation, I also want to note that speaking of intersex in the spectrum of lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans and intersex, we need to be aware that often this intersex constituent or refugee, if you like, might be a mother or a parent of an intersex child or baby. My assumption is that refugees who flee their countries due to the infant or the child being intersex go even more unnoticed through these systems as the mother appears to be a heterosexual woman with a baby or a child. Yet the reason for being shunned in the community um, and threatened for her or her child's life is due to her intersex condition. The challenges we need of LGBTI refugees are complex and multiple. To begin with, LGBTI refugees cannot be integrated in places um, with people of their, their own community in the country where they choose to flee to. They need to be integrated by people of a different or yet a similar community. Um, 
for example, LGBTI people. But how does one organize this, especially when the person might be challenged by not speaking and understanding English, or vast cultural differences? And there are no organized LGBTI communities in South Africa here for this. This is where the paper comes back to the constitution of South Africa being a promise on paper. The backlash of a country which quoted my earlier words went into a very smooth process of becoming a de democratic country. There was no civil war, government group or genocide, but there was also no community consultation and not enough understanding when drafting the constitution. In general, people did not understand the full impact of a constitution with an anti-discrimination law, spelling out sexual orientation and gender. South Africa is a classic example of a country where written law and lived experiences are in many cases in conflict with each other, and often due to a disconnect of what is written and what people want and understand. One of the most severe examples, not only in South Africa, but in the world, of people in communities objecting to the civil rights gained by LGBTI community is the escalating number of corrective rights of LGBTI people. Although it was there before the gains of the civil union law, many LGBTI analysts reason it escalated as a direct response to the law. Lesbians, effeminate gay men, trans people and gender non-conforming people in townships and black communities are the most at risk. The perpetrators are most often, if not always, people from the same communities, family members, friends and neighbours. Equal to that, it is not only LGBTI individuals but also LGBTI organisations that face the challenge of being discrimination, discriminated against. On an organization level, most organizations in the LGBTI sector do not receive South African government funding. The resources are limited, and as in the case of most LGBTI organizations globally, and therefore programs are limited to what the organizational capacity allows. Alongside that, the daily work of most LGBTI organizations and programs are involved with fighting the oppressions and challenges on behalf of their constituency sometimes, received from various government departments. These include lack of access to health services, education for LGBTI learners and unfair treatment by police. In the case when police even consider LGBT people's cases. <coughs> With regard to trans specific services or the lack thereof, the constant battle of getting the Sex Discrimination Act, Act 49 implemented when trans people have to access any contracts in need for the identification, namely driver's license, buying or selling of property, cars, bank accounts. Um, all of this should be in place in a country which boasts about having the most liberal constitution in the world. In reality, with our constitution, these types of advocacy and work for LGBTI organizations should be redundant. Yet we are underfunded by our government, and that is a sign of being not recognized or prejudiced against, and constantly busy with the work which should have been protected by our constitution. As much as we have a liberal constitution, we do not hear many people in South Africa speaking their minds or their thoughts. Racism, xenophobia, homophobia, queerphobia, lesbophobia, and other forms of discrimination become domesticated. In a civil service, it becomes subtle. The way we treat refugees, the inhumane long waiting queues where people have to spend night after night in the rain and went outside the Home Affairs office for months just to get the first meeting date, which is basically just the first step to be written into a register. These are just some of the examples of how disconnect between our liberal constitution and the challenges faced by LGBTI individuals, including refugees, and also other LGBT organizations. So thank you. Thank you.